Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be picking up where we, I left off last time uh, with Tails and go through some of the utilities with you today, uh, kind of give you some explanation and some thoughts on uh, what I think about them right after this. As you remember from last time, if you watched that video on Tails 4.4.1, it wasn't more than about two hours after I posted the video that uh, the Tails folks released 4.5. And yeah, they release a new version about once a month or so, and I think the next one is coming out in May. That would be 4.6. So I'm going to pick up uh, and kind of duck, uh, dovetail on the back of the other Tails video and explain some of the differences between it and 4.5. But one of the things that I really wanted to accomplish with this video was to take a look at some of the uh, included uh, features of Tails that I didn't cover last time because I wanted some time to kind of play around with the software a little bit. So, yeah, so I'm not going to cover Lux. I mean, you can do that on any, almost any Linux distribution, so that's not particularly unique to Tails. Also, I, I do want to talk about Veracrypt uh, for encrypted volumes and how you handle those in, within Tails. There are some caveats on what Tails supports and what it does not. Uh, also, uh, uh, GNU PGP. Again, not unique to Tails. That's a standard utility that's available on almost any Linux distribution today. Uh, Matt, you can find under Ubuntu. Um, it's, it's not located in the Fedora repositories, uh, but there is a, a GitHub if you want to download it and compile it from source. Uh, but Matt is used to anonymize, anonymize uh, the metadata that's stored within the files. Now, one of the problems that we have today and I don't know if, you, if you've ever looked at the amount of metadata that Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint or any of the Office suite generates. It's frightening. Uh, the amount of uh, information that is uh, attacked on to the document and sent uh, both to their cloud and also across the Internet if you are sending it as an attachment via email, for example. So there's some ways that we can clean that up a little bit before we send those kinds of documents out. Uh, KeyPass XC, not going to cover that. Again, that's a standard utility. That that's just stores passwords uh, encrypted in a database on your local system. Uh, GTK hash, again, that's not unique. And uh, But PD, now this says PDP, it should be PDF. Uh, and that is the Redact tools that are in there. That, that utility we'll talk about in length. It does a number of interesting things besides just stripping out the metadata. Tesseract OCR, again, isn't unique to Tails, and FFmpeg certainly is not unique to Tails, so I'm not going to cover those. So I'm, today I'm going to cover uh, persistent volumes. I'm going to talk a little bit about Veracrypt. I'm going to talk a little bit about Matt. I'm going to talk a little bit about PDP uh, Redact tools. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about, now I know that uh, the Onion uh, share is not unique to Tails, but Tails certainly is a good place to use it. And so I want to go through the features of that as well with you. So um, I guess the first place I probably ought to start is uh, uh, with a full screen here. So let's, let me bring up a browser here and, and we'll go to the Tails website. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, as you can see, this has changed. <laughs> that was a little different. Uh, but yeah, if you want to d download this, uh, you can download it to if you're running a Windows if you're running on a Windows machine when you're downloading this. There's a uh, a method for installing it onto a USB flash disk, uh, also for Mac and also Linux. So. Uh, since I'm on Linux, we'll, we'll start from there. Uh, there is a number of things you can do here. Uh, you can burn it to a DVD. You can run it in a virtual machine. Uh, just realize that if you do, do install Tails in a virtual machine, there are special instructions for that. And so a couple of caveats. So let's talk about virtual machines for a moment. So yes, yeah, so you can run Tails in a virtual machine. Just be aware that the host, if you're running this in a Type 2 uh, VM, that is one that's hosted by an operating system such as OpenBox or, or uh, Boxes, GNOME Boxes, or Vert Manager, that your host machine is basically the 
uh, it is providing the hardware that that virtual machine is using. And so anything you push across the network is going gonna, is gonna to be appear somewhere in one of your logs on your host machine. Uh, now, yes, it's encrypted. That transmission of the data is encrypted, but there are fingerprints that you're leaving as to the time and the date and what you, and you, you know, what type of protocol you're using, which would be Tor, and uh, and they, people, you, know, you would pick that up. So, yeah, you are going to be using, you are going to be leaving uh, fingerprints. You can also use Tails on a local network to attach to host servers and get files and, and all those kinds of things that you normally would with any Linux distribution. But again, realize that you are leaving fingerprints on the host systems that you're attaching to. You're leaving, uh, you're leaving uh, both a login to log into that site, you're leaving a, tight, a time stamp in the logs. So yeah, just be aware that, um, that you can do these sort of things, but that if you're trying to use this to anonymize your experience on the web, you are leaving footprints on your local machines and also on any machines that you might be attaching to that might be in the cloud. So there's the instructions. You would download it. You would install it to a USB stick. Uh, restart the machine onto the USB stick. I mean, again, Tails is meant to run from a USB or a DVD. Uh, you then configure it, and then you have to restart after each configuration change. So, and then let's go. It would start to download the software onto your machine. I'm not going to do that. I've already done that. And then, of course, you would, you know, you you would do the normal things: check your signature, make sure that what you downloaded is correct. And you have two choices: you can download direct, or you can download using BitTorrent. Uh, your choice. Um, and then you can verify with OpenPGP the signature of the files. And that's basically it. You burn it to a, a USB stick, and then you reboot your machine into that environment. So that's kind of what we're going to do here. So I have already started this off a USB stick. This is 4.5, and we can certainly validate that. I have been using this, and I have cleaned it off back to a system that would be in, it would be represent one that had just been installed onto the USB. So I haven't done any configuration to this. And of course, Tails, as, as you probably recall from last time, it erases everything anyway. So this is a clean slate. But one thing I do want to do is get rid of that. And I'll probably want to make that just a little bit bigger so that you can see what I'm doing. The first thing I'm going to do is, I, and I could do, I could do this. I could go down here to Tails, and now there should be an About Tails, and it should tell me that this is 4.5. Uh, and that's one way you can find out what version number that you are running on, but you can also do it this way. Oops. And it also tells you this is uh, 4.5, but it does say unstable again. I, I guess they I guess they just never update this to stable. This is <laughs> even though this is a stable release. So um, but that's OK. That's fine. We can deal with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the basic difference between 4.4.1 and 4.5 is they've included the ability to support secure boot. So if you have a, a newer Mac, let's say it's uh, later than, I think it's 2016, where they started installing the T2 chip and actually started to enforce it, uh, the T2 chip would block normally a Linux distribution from installing uh, because Apple only wants, of course, you to install the Mac OS. But there are instructions on the tail site, we can go to that, on how to get around that. <laughs> Manually update. I think it's here. Oh, no. No, it's not. It's uh, here where it talks about it. So there, there is some changing the settings of the startup security utility of your Mac to authorize uh, starting from Tails. And <laughs> basically, they just disable the secure boot process on the Mac. So they uh, basically are bypassing. I don't know how long this method will work. I know Apple is working diligently to prevent us from using the Mac from anything other than running Mac OS, which is 
I guess their their call, but you know, to me, if I buy a piece of hardware, it's mine. It doesn't belong to you, Apple. Um, and I know that you think otherwise, but uh, anyway, that's a topic for another day. So, um, uh, so let me let me show you what uh, yeah what I'm sh what I'm seeing here. So this is the differences in 4.5 information on secure boot. Uh, if you get this message on you're trying to boot to a Mac, then you just go to this link here and it will step you through how to bring up the machine and using the command R and getting to the startup security utility where you can then shut off the T2 chip from uh, preventing you from, uh, uh, from uh, running. Now, I know, like I said, I don't know how long that's going to work, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So let's go back over here to Tails. So the first thing, I, you know, I mean, I could go ahead and set up my, my network right now. I'm not going to do that because I'm going to have to end up, I'm going to have to reboot this machine anyway after I do this. So if I come down here to my Tails tab, you'll notice that there are two things here. I can configure a persistent store or I can delete a persistent store. If you configure a persistent store, you have to restart the machine, and during the process of restarting, it will have you enable that persistent store. When you're done with it and you don't want it anymore, you can delete it, but you cannot have the persistent store enabled. That is, it can't be active. So you would have to restart and don't enable the persistent store and then delete it, and then you can, then you can move on. So. I don't know, maybe it probably walked through that because it's probably confusing. So all you have to do to enable it is give it a password and I'll do a short one. And we'll go ahead and create it. It'll take a couple of seconds. And it won't take very long. It's basically just making room on the USB stick. Uh, one thing to note, though, you will need a USB stick at least 8 gig in order to do this. That's that's at least what I've been told. And, uh, yeah. So it'll, it'll be a while, I guess. It's working on it. Okay. The next thing it talks about here is this gives you a, a kind of a, I don't know of a way that you can come back in here and modify this. I haven't tried this once it's up and enabled. Um, but you can, you can tell it what kinds of data that you want to store. So I have personal data, which would be just files that I want to keep, maybe some uh, JPEGs or, or Word documents or spreadsheets, whatever. It can also preserve my uh, browser bookmarks between restarts. I can do that. I can keep my network connection information, like my Wi-Fi password, or if I have any specific configuration details. Now, uh, I will tell you that Tails doesn't recommend that you use a Wi-Fi uh, network, but you know one of the things that you'll <laughs> you'll be using Tails for is if you're in a coffee shop or something. That is going to be a Wi-Fi network that is probably unencrypted. So. Um, whether you want to keep that information or not, that's up to you. Just realize you would have to re-enter it every time you rebooted. Uh, if you are wanting to store additional software, and I do, I don't know if it'll give me a chance to actually configure that or not. It's It's got to configure it. Uh, oh, okay. All right, so I don't need that right now. Um, if I want to keep my email persistent, you know, or if I want an SSH client and I want to keep the keys, you know, around for that. So I'm going to just enable those two. Now, uh, Tails recommends that you only, that you start out with personal data and then add on the features that you want later. So if you have printers that you have configured and you want to preserve that. So this is basically preserving some state so that you can go back and reuse this again. So this is all I need. So I'll go ahead and let it create it, and it already did, so it's done. So at this point, nothing's going to happen here until I restart. So I'm going to go ahead and restart this.
that's what they mean by configuration as, as they're talking about that is you configure tails the way you want it and then save it unfortunately though i if i had gone into my net my it's only it only is going to preserve uh like my software or my personal apps after i reboot you know once i've enabled the persistent store and then reboot it so We'll wait till it comes back up. Okay, so it's it's uh, it, it brings up the welcome details, and this is where you would enable and unlock your encrypted uh, uh, systems and so forth here. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna go ahead and unlock it. Okay, successful. And the other thing I wanna do is I'll go in down here to additional settings and I can, I can you know, I can do my network connections and all that stuff here. Uh, you know, I'll change which one I want, but I need the admin password. So, this allows me to install software, right? It acts like this in my sudo. My sudo. So, I'm all done. I don't have any changes to language or the formats. It's all good. So, we'll go ahead and restart. And it'll, the screen will go black. It won't, re it won't reboot, but it will restart the graphical user interface. Okay. So that being done, I should now have, let's see. I have persistent now, a persistent store. And it's put my Tor browser in there. I'm gonna go ahead and start up another window of this. This is my home folder. Uh, you'll also notice the Tor browser is out here. So the first thing I need to do is, as you'll notice, I am not connected. So I need to get my network connected. <laughs> or we're not going to get very far with this. And hopefully, if I entered my password correctly, it should capture the time. Yep, and it's up. And then this will take a little while for, this is the uh, status of the uh, onion, of, the, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the network, the onion network. And it's up now. So I, can, I could go up here and check, the, check what's going on here. So I have circuits built and I'm all set and ready to go. Um, let's, um, so the first thing I think I wanna do here, and I'll have to change this again, of course. I'm just gonna make it black. I wish this was the default on all that, but anyway. That's a minor. That's a minor thing. So I want to do a sudo apt update first. I think that will work. And it's going through the proxies to get out to the appropriate um, repositories. And and I have to refresh these packages because they're not here. So if I were to try to install something, it would go. Uh, you don't have it. <laughs> so. So we'll wait on this and I'll be back in a second. Okay, so that is done finally. So I should be able to do This is the same password that I created in the uh, startup screen for Tails. 
Yep, there we go. So now it's going to install those. It should come when it's finished. It should pop up and tell, ask me if I want to make this a one-time or do I want to have it install these packages every time Tails reinstall it restarts. Yes, and it has to reinstall them because remember, Tails obliterates. <laughs> it erases everything. But it will do that for you automatically from your persisted store. Allegedly. Allegedly. I guess I should probably uh, wait on this, I guess. Well, I'll, I'll be back. So as you can see up here, it's asking me, do I want to install every time or just this one time? So that's your choice. If you just do it one time, of course, then these packages wouldn't be reinstalled in the next restart of Tails. Whereas if I say every every time, then of course it's going to attempt to reinstall them each time. And I have to wait for it to add that to the additional package list. Okay, so uh, first thing I think I want to do here, I'm just going to I'm just going to just kind of slip this over here for a minute. I'm going to go into Office and I'll go into uh, Writer. I want to I want to create some documents um, that and put some metadata in them. So let's see. Oops, I don't want the header. I want it down here, please. Okay. Okay, and then I'll go down here to properties and I'll enter some metadata. And you can see that it has already, you know, put in a, a little bit here, but I'll put in a title. This will be simple document version one. Now I could enter that as a custom property too. And this is going to be a test for Matt. And some keywords and some comments. So whatever it is you want, and of course, you, you know you can add custom properties, and if you have document control, if you have security, you want to make it read only, record the changes or whatever, and then statistics. So I'm done with that, and I'll go ahead and I'm going to save this out to the persistent store. So I'm going to go down here to persistent. I'm going to create a folder called docs. And then we'll name this just simple. It'll be, yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, so I've got that one. Now what I need to do is, that's not enough, right? Because we really want to give Matt a good run for its money here. So I want graphics. There we go. And I need I need uh, GIMP. You can tell that you are running off a USB stick. Okay, so I need to make a new document. Uh, this isn't a tutorial for GIMP. Sorry about that. I'm gonna see. I'll make that black. I'll put in this, and we'll change that color to red and we'll just paint that that's fine so there's my simple document uh, save as and again I want to put this into persistent into docs okay and then I want to export this too the reason I'm exporting this is because um, Matt doesn't understand XCF. It doesn't know what that is. It's not one of the file format types that it supports. So I'm creating, it'll do JPEG, it'll do GIF, it'll do PNG. I think it'll do uh, uh, TGA as well. So, okay, so I've got some stuff I can work with. 
So let me go. Okay, so there's my documents. So let's, uh, so mat two, we'll do a man on mat two, is the, is the metadata anonymizer. And, and it has a couple of things that it can do. Uh, it, it's, it's main, th here. <laughs> get this out of here so you can actually see it. So I have my face on it. Um, so it removes the metadata from various file formats. Uh, and it, but it doesn't, it doesn't clean the original. It leaves the original intact. So you can keep a copy of anything that you, you know, you've created metadata for because that might be useful to you. But when you're sending this off to somebody else, you may not want to expose that metadata to the Internet and to the uh, third party that you're sending this document to. Uh, again, this is all about trying to maintain your privacy. So... Um, yeah, you've got a number of things you can do. You can show the version. You can list all the file formats that it supports. Uh, if uh, there's any dependencies that are needed in order to, for MAT2 to be fully functional, you can do a check on that. For both, it gives you just status information. And then show, if there is harmful metadata that it detects, it'll list it for you. But it won't, there isn't, I wish there was, but there isn't any way that I know of to list all of the metadata in there. You know, to see the, the master list of the metadata, but there are Unix uh, Linux applications that will do that. So yeah, there are there are a number of them that, that will do that. But for today, all I want to know is what do we got here? We got man. Let's do a list first on all the formats. Oh, that. Okay. So these are all of the ones that it will support. You can do now. Zip metadata is. Yeah, it's kind of small, I think, <laughs> but yeah, it'll give you that. It'll do video, it does audio, it does uh, PNGs and JPEGs and all that stuff. It also does HTML, uh, and then of course the the normal kind of things. Now, I don't see Microsoft, although it does have PDF. I don't see my Microsoft. Oh yeah, it does XLS. Uh, well, will it? Hmm, don't know. Don't know if it'll do Microsoft documents. If not, that would be a real shame. DocX, yes, it does. PTP, P PPTX, and DocX, yes, it will. Okay. Yeah, that is probably the primary reason for wanting to do this because of the, all the junk that Microsoft sticks in here. So let's do a MAT2. And I'll just run it against simple.odt. Now, I can do a minus S, and we can do a check for anything that might be har considered harmful. And then it'll list out, oh, gee, you've got, you know, there's some things that are kind of weird here uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't really like. So let's go ahead and strip it. And then we'll do the map pass on against that one. So it'll create a new file called simple, and then it'll insert cleaned in the middle of it. So we can run... Let's see if it really got got it or not. Oops. Yeah, so it, it actually stripped out all the metadata. There isn't anything left. I can do the same thing on um, I could run it against XEF, but it's just going to tell me it's not supported. So it's not supported. But yeah, there's metadata in that too. So let's do the same thing. Let's just strip that out. And again, it's gone. So that's what it does. Uh, the other one. Oh, I, I don't think uh, we can try it, but I don't think they'll give me anything, uh, any any uh, anything useful other than it just tells me to run it with help. Okay, great. We'll run it with help. So it gives you a number of options here. One is you can explode this into a number of PNGs. So you can take a P. I don't have any PDF files here on this in, on this, but if I did. 
I could take each page of it out and create a, uh, a PNG file out of it and then send that, and that would mean that the, that text would be immutable. I could then take that group of PNGs and put them back into a PDF, which again uh, is immutable. They wouldn't be able to do any, anything to it. So it gives me a way to keep the document the same without having somebody tamper with it or not allowing somebody to tamper with it. The other thing is that you can run uh, a sanitize, which again goes through and strips out anything that is considered malware or harmful or uh, might reveal your identity. And then, uh, and then if a space saver, you can convert it to black and white, which makes the file just a little bit smaller. And that's really it uh, for that, that particular tool. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit since we've got this here, I'm going to go ahead and sh close this down. I'll bring up a, a file window. And let's do the, let's just go down to persistent here. Okay, so there's my documents. And what I want to do is I want to bring up, I want, I'd like to bring up, okay, that's the circuit, there's the store and show you how this works. <clears throat> so the way this works is I would t do an add and then I would go down to persistent. That's where my documents are, All right? And I get a list here. So I'm gonna pick that cleaned and that cleaned and I'm gonna open those. So those two documents are now shareable. And, and what will happen here is when I start sharing, it's going to set up a network in, with these files made available inside of, of the Onion, inside of Tor. So it'll take a while to set this up. And what it should give me when this is all done setting up is that it, it, it'll say, uh, once a file has been downloaded, it's going to shut this down. So this, uh, this connection doesn't remain open. Uh, so you're only leaving it open for the length of time that you're telling your third party to go get the files. And once they've got them, it shuts down. Um, the other thing it does is it will give you this URL. And so what is that good for? Well, let's copy that. I know this is on the same machine. This is kind of silly, but bear with me. <laughs> Anybody with a Tor browser, you have to have a Tor browser to do this, of course. If they have that URL, we'll be able to gain access to those documents. And this is how you do it. So I'll leave that up. We'll come back to that. So I'll do a paste here. And in a few, in a, in a few seconds, 10, 15 seconds, it'll come back with my list. And I can download all of them or I can select, you know, I can download all of them. And it's going to... Instead of bringing them down as separate files, you'll notice that it zips them together. And I'll go ahead and save that. Uh, I could try to put it in persistent, but it will fail. So this is actually is storing it in the outer directory under Tor browser. So I will need to move this or this will disappear. So hopefully it is now down. This says it's done. So let's just see before we do anything else. We'll go back to my home folder here. We'll go into the Tor browser. And sure enough, there is my zip file. So let me open another window. And we'll go into persistent. And I'll, I'll just do it out here because I don't want those documents to sit, you know, to be copied inside of, of mine. So, okay. So this is now persistent. Let's go ahead. We're done with that. We'll go ahead and close that. And we can close that. And I'll go ahead and open this up and we'll extract it. Yeah, that's fine. Extract it right there. Okay. So, there's my document that I just sent. And that's how the onion share works. The other thing I wanted to talk about was this utility right here, Unlock VeraCrypt Volumes. Now, I'm gonna, I, I should have left that torpor up because, actually, you know what? I think what I'm gonna do is I'll switch away from this for a second. 
and I'll go back over to a full screen and then I'll come back to this. So um, I want to go to documents. And down here it talks about encryption. And it talks about using VeraCrypt encrypted volumes. So there's this handy chart here that talks about that on the compatibility. This is strictly for tails. Normally when you have VeraCrypt, you have the, the uh, application that allows you to create the, uh, the volume, but tails does not include it. They only allow you to open one. And so uh, you, once you get it open, you can modify it. You can add whatever you want to it. But, you, uh, but Tails itself does not have the utility to actually create the volume. So that has to be done externally. And you would presumably have to transfer it into uh, Tails in order for it to uh, see it. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure. I suppose they probably have their reasons for this. But... Um, and I'm sure they have very good reasons for it. I just don't, I don't know what it is. So one of the things you can do with VeraCrypt is you can create visible volumes, which have a file that, that looks like a file and is stored in the file system. Or you can have hidden volumes, which only VeraCrypt can see and only you can remember. You have to remember the name of the volume that you gave it uh, in order to see it. And, but again, that's all plausible deniability. But again, somebody that is uh, good is going to look at the amount of disk space that your system is using, and they'll see a discrepancy between the files that are listed and the amount of disk that's taken. So <laughs> anyway, six half dozen, right? So um, yeah, so the only thing I'm allowed to do is to go out and find a, a file container and open it. That's it. So I don't have one, so... I'm pretty much done with that, and there and you won't find Veracrypt in the in the libraries in the the, re, the repos. Uh, so to be able to use it, uh, as far as we talked about all of that, let's see if I'm missing anything. Oh, when uh, there's an update to Tails, when you initially boot it, it'll say, hey, if there's a new update to Tails, do you want to install it? And it will go ahead and write it onto your USB, and that updates your system. So you don't have to reburn the USB. You, don't have, you won't lose your persistent volume. It remembers all that. So as far as I know, uh, unless, of course, it's areas of the disk that you've marked not to keep. So again, that all depends on the options you select in the persistent volume. Uh, that's all I had today uh, and all the information that I wanted to collect and give to you on what I have discovered. Uh, one other thing I noticed on the virtual machines that I want to talk about briefly before I end this. There is instructions on there for Vert Manager that allows you to go in and download and create a, a image. And an image, of course, would be a a uh, virtual disk that you could then mount into the VM, mark it as a USB type, and then start it up. And there you should be able to create a persistent volume. You do have to, now you have to take the image they give you, which is about 1.6 gig or so. Then you use the Linux truncate, I know this is funny, you use the Linux truncate command to actually expand it to 8 gig. And then you can use that Invert Manager as a, an existing uh, disk uh, when you create the virtual machine. And then you go into the configuration for that vert drive and change it to a USB type. However, I wasn't successful in getting that to work. I followed the steps care as carefully as I could. The problem I had was that when Tails came up, this was in 4.4.1. I haven't tried it yet on 4.5. But in 4.4.1, it failed because it said I have a configuration mismatch, and Debian dropped me into a command line prompt uh, with no further explanation. So I would have to dig into the logs and go figure out what's going on with it. Now, probably I probably will try it on 4.5 first and see if that works. But that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And as always, hope to get to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.